about prevention, uh, the history of prevention in Salina? Well, the uh, prevention programs of Sun Street, now called Parts and Steps, um, operating out of the three community recovery centers, Salinas, uh, Seaside, and South County, um, have been associated with Sun Street and with me personally for 37 years. Uh, the, the most immediate part of that is that Parts uh, was a separate uh, organization that we founded in the early 1990s uh, based on um, a grant from, that was administered by the Pacific Institute of Research and Evaluation in Berkeley. Uh, it was federal money and there were several sites that were chosen around the United States. The reason that Salinas was chosen, as told to me by Elizabeth Stanley, who was the alcohol program administrator for Monterey County, was because of the public policy work that Sun Street had done in the early, I mean the late 1980s. Um, there was a researcher named Fried Whitman who worked with Sun Street also on the um, remodeling of Sun Street. He was an architect and had worked with community uh, mental health centers. Fried was focused on public policy and worked with the city of Salinas and with me uh, principally at first to stop the concurrent sales of alcohol and gasoline. There was a 7-Eleven that had um, uh, asked for a conditional use permit out on Sanborn Road near Highway 101 and we, that was the point of entry uh, for us to start dealing with public policy. There was some work done and I believe adopted uh, by the um, Planning Commissioner, City Council is kind of fuzzy now about concurrent sales where on conditional use permits they would have to go through certain hoops in order to do that. Um, in addition to that, I mean, in the parts, we started as a separate organization uh, so that it would not be uh, confused in any way with the, uh, or, or contaminated, if you will, by other operations. Um, after several years, the grant ran out. Sun Street already had all the prevention monies from the county uh, to operate the community recovery centers. And so Bob Agnew, who was the uh, chief of the uh, mental health unit at the county, asked that uh, Sun Street work it out with parts uh, to com so that there would be continued funding for the public policy approach based in the community recovery centers. Uh, we did that. Uh, Linda Sanchez, who had been the, the director of parts, the, um, had been on the Sun Street board for 15 years before that and was, I believe, president or vice president at the time that parts started and was my choice and, and others uh, to head it up uh, because of her interest, you know, in the, in the uh, problem of alcoholism generally. So... Um, the community recovery centers had the um, money, prevention monies to operate them because Elizabeth Stanley also had uh, put out bids for community recovery centers in three areas of the county. And these were based on neighborhood recovery centers, which were prevention projects that had been done in San Diego. I mentioned this goes back 37 years. Some of the people that are, I mean, Bob Reynolds, who later was a consultant to parts, was the alcohol program administrator in uh, San Diego County, and actually modeled his neighborhood recovery centers after Sun Street Centers, which had done quite a bit of community work, um, kind of at a, uh, a, a level of involving community agencies uh, in dealing with certain aspects as it affected their agency. So it's always been an environmental uh, um, approach. That was based on work that, I mean, on you know, papers that I wrote in 1973 and 1974. The first one was the social model recovery. The other was, um, no, it was, it was based on um, halfway, I mean, on uh, recovery program, I mean, on recovery uh, houses, but it incorporated the social model approach. And then in 1974, I wrote the community model which really focused on um, environmental aspects and what ought to be done at the community level. Bob Reynolds, as I mentioned, was part of that. Um, Sun Street in the 
early 1980s uh, had, adopt, had instituted the, in prevention the alcohol awareness program, which was tied in with Hartnell College and with uh, Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. We had visiting uh, speakers come in and we targeted various groups. In other words, how alcohol affected the family, how alcohol affected women, how alcohol affected teenagers, how alcohol affected uh, a variety of different uh, subjects. And we got uh, people to, or groups, like the uh, university women, the um, Rotary Clubs, and, and groups like that to sponsor a speaker that actually uh, addressed their particular concerns. Uh, the alcohol awareness, uh, kind of ironic that the, uh, there was a shift in funding uh, for counseling uh, of teenagers that was happened in the schools and, and so the monies were taken away from prevention at that time uh, to fund um, youth counseling in the schools. Um, we had patterned uh, the alcohol awareness program after the one that was done at Eisenhower Medical Center which was started by Dr. Joe Cruz, who started the Betty Ford Center. He and I were on the State Alcoholism Advisory Board together, and I was chairman in 1978. And based on the social model approach, with the um, uh, support of Dr. Cruz and, and several other people, we started trying to affect public policy and working with alcohol beverage control at that time. Um, it was quite an active um, process. What makes that significant is up until um, the mid-70s and then later in 78 when I was chair of the state board and everything, the dominant model had been the disease model of the treatment of individuals for disease. And there was the notion that somehow uh, alcoholism existed in the individual, unique individuals, that because of biology and psychology they were uniquely um, prone uh, to the development of problems. So the prevention, what there was of it, was aimed at youth, uh, which uh, was done here in Salinas by uh, Sunrise House. It was somehow or another, if we could teach the problems in grades K through 12, we would prevent alcoholism in later life. That was a very disjointed approach because they were treating individuals, uh, but they were trying to educate uh, individuals early so there was not a combined or united model of prevention. Social model and community model united it under the public health model, which basically said the treatment of individuals that were alcoholic was tertiary prevention. Intervention was secondary prevention. Then primary prevention was located at the issue of trying to uh, lower the amount of sales in a particular area, uh, the number of outlets, which later parts got very involved in, to affect public policy and in, the, in group policies. So like when I joined Rotary in the early 1980s, we adopted a policy that where Rotary no longer had open bars uh, because we would, that's in and of itself is seen as, as alcohol abuse. And so therefore it was a no host bar where people had to purchase their own alcohol. So it's even at little levels like that. Uh, concurrent to all of this, there, Mary Ross, who was the director of the um, uh, Monterey Peninsula Council on Alcoholism, uh, based on the social model thing, she developed the notion of the community as the client and went after all of the things that existed in individuals and identified them as a parallel in the community. The denial process, the uh, the, the notion that there was interaction, social interaction, among a large group of people that resulted in attitudes about alcoholism and when it began. So the whole notion of the community of the client was to lower the threshold of, of identifying alcohol problems. Uh, instead of waiting till somebody was in late stages of alcoholism and lost their jobs and everything, saying, that's alcoholism, we tried to identify it early on where it became a principal focus within a family, within an individual, within, within communities. Um, I mentioned Rotary earlier. It was interesting that um, one of the uh, um, local uh, owners of a company, it happened to be an agricultural company, 
uh, said, what can we do about Charlie, who was vice president? I said, what about him? He said, well, he's got an alcohol problem. I said, okay, uh, what does Charlie want to do? He says, well, I don't know, but we're going to have to let him go unless he straightens up. And I said, he said, what can you do to help him? I said, well, let me ask you a question. I know that you give fifths of whiskey at Christmas to all of your uh, executives when they've done a good year, uh, in addition to bonuses, what are you going to give Charlie when he comes back? And so he said, what's that got to do with us? And I said, well, he's going to be a fish. I mean, he's going to be an alien in your company. So it, it was on, on a personal basis that a lot of things were done to affect company policies, community policy, and so forth, with the understanding that uh, an alcoholic has a web of relationships that affects not only his recovery, but the development of the problem. So that is the, um, in that is a, is a lot of history, but it goes back a long way. I, w I mentioned Freed Whitman earlier. <clears throat> Freed was a researcher uh, in Berkeley, and he had worked with Harold Holder, who was the director of the Pacific Institute of Research and Evaluation. I think they had a professional falling out about who owned in, uh, public policy issues. Harold had published a number of papers and was well known and, and quite an expert in the field of uh, environmental or policy prevention efforts. Uh, Freed also had worked with a group uh, called the Alcohol Research Group, which still exists. And their principal at the time in 1978, that period when I was active in the state area, was uh, Don Cahalan who had done, uh, and also Robin Room, who later succeeded him as the head of the alcohol research group, had focused on environmental recovery. Probably the, large, the biggest uh, shift, the tipping point in the state uh, was that the, uh, in 1978, there was a group called um, California Conference on Alcohol Problems, which Elizabeth Stanley and I were kind of the, uh, on the founding board of that. Um, we had a conference, and Lauren Archer, who had been at the state level, head of the pro alcohol programs, was then at the federal level, and he came and he talked. We, in fact, we had him talk about public policy and prevention, which was quite a radical approach at that time because almost all the monies was being spent in youth counseling programs. Yeah, you mentioned youth counseling. Isn't that the secondary approach, the intervention approach? Rather well, than it, intervention it's approach? secondary intervention if there is a, um, a problem developing. And I mean, primary prevention is prevention of the problem to begin with. Secondary prevention is to intervene in the early stages or the development of the problem. Tertiary prevention is basically to prevent death, and it's after the problem is already present. Sunrise House it was not limited to just uh, alcohol problems and drug, well, actually mostly drug problems. They were talking about all sorts of youth problems and inter family interventions. And uh, they followed the family systems model, which, uh, I mean, the director of that, Elgie Belizio, recognized that there was a system of developing of problems. But much of their effort was directed at finding kids in trouble in school, uh, trying to affect some policies that directly affected kids, um, such as getting uh, the kids that were involved in sports for their parents and the child to sign a non-use policy. Uh, I, I tried to encourage them to go beyond that and have the board, the school boards, also have a non-use policy, but uh, we weren't able to affect that. What about um, the name of parts? How did that come to be? Well, when we, when we started it, I was on the, one of the founding members of the coalition. We were searching for a name, and I came up with the name of prevention alcohol, preventing alcohol-related trauma, which I wanted to call it part for do your part. Uh, because it was in Salinas, the first one, it was they added uh, prevention of alcohol-related trauma in Salinas and named it PARTS, so it, it was my name. STEPS came later, uh, and that was, STEPS uh, was developed after PART, I'm not sure of this. Uh, I don't know if STEPS developed under PARTS when it was separate from Sun Street or afterwards, 
but that's where the um, uh, was more of the school focus of trying to impact the school thing. I think I don't know to what degree. I mean, I lost some touch with that because when we merged with parts, um, uh, Linda ceased to be on the board of directors and became an employee of Sun Street and was uh, to direct the parts program. And as I said, the county shifted its prevention, I mean, told us to shift what prevention money we had uh, to the parts program and we co-located it in the community recovery centers. Um, also, there were many grants that were pursued for the, I mean, a number of years uh, to augment uh, county, uh, the funding, the county funding came from the federal government through the state to the county for prevention efforts. It's always been a, or at least as long as I was around, which was up till 10 years ago, it was a relatively small amount of money. I mean, prevention is always uh, kind of an afterthought with people is, gee, it's something we ought to do. Unfortunately, there, there continues to be the mindset, uh, which in the social model papers and the training I did throughout the state was trying to overcome the, um, if you will, the industrial model that has inputs and outputs. In other words, if we tell you something, you will change your attitude about it. And if you change your attitude, you'll change your behavior. That was the dominant model. And that was, believe me, it's the basis of all K through 12 education. We found that quite the opposite, actually coming out of recovery, that if people change their behavior for a wide variety of reasons, very unique to individuals, why people change behavior. But if they change their behavior, they will change their attitude. And once they change their attitude, they will try to find out everything they can about what was the problem to begin with. Now, it's, it's, obviously it is uh, reinforcing. I mean, it's not a straight line. But we did follow the, we want to change behaviors instead of we want to change information. We want to change behaviors. That was uniquely in, in in many ways was associated with me personally and with Sun Street generally. And uh, we had a variety of retail programs, if you will, uh, that had been at Sun Street a long time of, of the men that were in recovery going out and helping in the community. That was to break down the notion that these somehow were strange individuals. And it's to start to show they were very, very active members of the community. So they're... to be based out of recovery centers. I'm not understanding the sequence of events there. And okay. Sun Street's um, involvement is just... Right. Uh, YouTube, no, a lot of this history. Okay. I don't, so I'm not... I'm not well, uh, covered again that um, we started uh, parts uh, as a separate organization, separate from Sun Street. Who did we? Um, Elizabeth Stanley, who was the alcohol program administrator, uh, myself, people that were going to get involved with parts, Linda Sanchez, the probably a, a major uh, push for that came from the Pacific Institute of Research and Evaluation, which for research purposes wanted to make sure that it was kind of a freestanding uh, effort that would not, if, if you form the coalition, uh, that was over parts, which are big community coalitions made up of people from all different types of agencies and everything. That if it was directly connected with Sun Street, it would necessarily get involved with other Sun Street issues, uh, lobbying, if you will, the Board of Supervisors for money for recovery homes. We did not want to con contaminate it with extra issues. So we formed a 501c3 with the name of parts to uh, effect the environmental prevention program for research. They had funds for at least three years. It may have run longer, I'm not sure. But the funds from the federal government for that research project stopped. Sun Street already had all of the prevention money to operate the community recovery centers. That was started by Liz Stanley also. 
Bob Agnew, who was the mental health director and was in charge of alcohol and drug programs at that time, liked parts. I mean, of course, he did not want to see parts uh, with Linda being <laughs> chair of our board of directors and director of that coming to him with two hats on saying, take the money from this, give it to that. So we just merged and parts became, uh, was absorbed into Sun Street Centers. Uh, and then we used the prevention monies we had to continue that funding through, from, based in the community recovery centers. But also it was augmented by many, many different grants from many different sources. Uh, Linda and others um, were very busy writing grants. It always concerned me uh, because grants run out. <laughs> and yeah. there was not the basis of ongoing funding. Uh, for the prevention at the level we were doing it. Also, the problem that my board of, I mean, my Sun Street's board of directors had to wrestle with at first was that when you get into public policy and really challenging um, um, cities and agencies and others about um, the sale of alcohol, in other words, restricting the sale of alcohol by closing or not re-upping certain uh, outlets. That is a politically charged um, action, which the board was worried could affect um, Sun Street's getting money for its recovery, for its individual recovery programs. So there was a quite a bit of discussion about, are we going to endanger uh, the recovery home and all of the other direct services that we gave by picking up this political action. Because anytime you deal with public policy, it's politics. I mean, there's no two ways about it. The board took the risk uh, to do it, primarily because we had been involved in it so long. And so they felt, you know, and, and I would strongly support it because, I mean, treating individuals uh, for the problem is not the way you're going to solve the problem with alcohol and drugs. There were a lot of changes in public policies, uh, state level and, and elsewhere during this period. And this merger with Sun Street was in the late 80s, early 80s? No, uh, parts started in the early 90s. So the merger would have been probably in the late 90s, 96, <clears throat> 96 or 97, maybe as late as 98. It was no earlier than 98, I mean no later than 98, and probably no earlier than 95. So I would say it was between 95 and 98 we merged. I would guess 1996 or 7. Steps came after? Steps, I'm not sure when Steps was started. Uh, I, I, I can't answer that. I, I, I tend to think that Steps started after the merger, okay. but I'm not certain of that. Did it exist outside of Sun Street? No, it, it's a no. Creation? It, it, was, it was a creation and um, uh, Linda did create that while, I mean, under Sun Street, uh, while she was an employee of Sun Street, yes. That, that's my guess. I do not think it started under parts. If it did, it was part of the merger thing and came in with the other parts coalition program. We continued the coalition uh, as a separate body because it was focused you know, on environmental prevention and on public policy. Mm -hmm. So it, um, it ran along with, I mean, there was the Sun Street Board of Directors and then the coalition continued uh, as an advisory group. Um, uh, it had no direct administrative uh, control over parts. That was under Sun Street through me, but we gave a lot of deference to the parts coalition as far as directing which, where we would go next.
Well, you did good to keep me this short because, I mean, there's tons of other stuff. <laughs> Well, it's, it's one of the things that's really important to recognize uh, is that philosophical shift that took place in the, I and as an individual and Sun Street as an organization was probably the lead group that affected that policy statewide and ultimately led to the, uh, the grant coming to Salinas to establish parts. So, long history. Now we have the SAMHSA grant, which is uh, also for the coalition work and public policy. So good. That's, that's a good tenure. Glad it continued. The, uh, uh, the problem always with prevention, not just in, in the alcohol and drug field, uh, but in all types of prevention. I mean, it, it, it's always an afterthought. I mean, it's a nice thing that people, well, it's nice to talk about prevention. But, I mean, look at cancer. There's very little money, relatively speaking, spent in prevention. And there is ample evidence that large amounts, I mean, principally, probably 95% of cancer is caused by um, environmental triggers and individual behavior that is largely socially prescribed. So, I mean, if you want to affect behavior, it's, I, I will, it's interesting that uh, Dr. Robert O'Brien, who wrote uh, the uh, Recovery from Alcoholism and Social Treatment Model, used uh, heart disease as a, carl as, as a parallel with alcoholism because he said heart disease to a large extent, I mean, it had, it had um, biological factors, I mean, it had genetic factors, and it had uh, the individual psychology, uh, you know, that affects a person's behavior. But to a large degree, uh, the things that help develop heart disease are found in the environment in the way that we do things, how we, how we eat, how we lack of exercise, what we demand of people, the stress, and everything else. And that basically he, as a physician, was counseling people with heart disease to follow the same pattern as recovery. He's saying you're going to have to change the behavior, you're going to have to change the people you hang around with, and that he spent a lot of time uh, on alcoholism talking about environmental influences, but also uh, talking about uh, a, a variety of different medical problems that had environmental, uh, heavily environmental influence. So, Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> The genesis of parts was the um, public policy work that Sun Street had done in the late 1980s. Uh, it was developed separately because of research uh, issues. In other words, it wanted to be separated. When Sun Street had already been funded as the prevention effort in this county, and when parts ran out of money or the grants ceased, and it was then a federal grant? it was federal grant and that Bob Agnew with the county wanted parts and Sun Street parts to be merged under Sun Street so that we could continue the prevention efforts of the coalition. Okay. Okay. That's good. I think I got that. It, 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 I'm just losing batteries. Oh, okay. Through that, through that point. So it was countywide? No, city. it was in Salinas. It was just city. Just the city of Salinas, and then later when we a branch on grants and everything into Seaside and into South County, we developed the same thing. Did now, the, the focus of parts, there were th three focus. The first was on DU, I mean, it was on DUI, uh, underage drinking, and also, um, I think it was just on public policy about trying to reduce the number.